when I started in this hobby of model railroading, I, I joined the local model railroad club, and along with that, there was a local show that went on. And I visited the show as part of the club. Uh, we brought the club modular layout to the show, and, you know, I, I met a manufacturer that nobody ever seen before. It was the first time he ever made it to a show, so we all went over and chatted with him. His name was Mark Williams. He was standing there with a guy named Joe LeMay and Mark's wife, and, uh, we all were chatting away and all that jazz, and it ended up that Mark lived uh, in the same small town as I did. A town, 1,200 people. Imagine that. <laughs> Funny I said that, because the company's name was Imagine That Laser Art. And Mark is an artist. He was a sculptor. Uh, he's a sculpturist. He's an airbrush artist. Every kind of artist in the world. So... Um, I started getting involved with Mark by building his website and building some uh, kits and doing a little bit of kit instructions, not too much. Don't blame me for all that. Anyways, uh, years pass and, uh, you know, we're all great friends, yada, 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 and the company was sold. At the same time, I also moved from that small town to my hometown of London, Ontario. Well, it seems that Imagine That Laser Art was sold. And the funny thing is, is the, the guy who bought the, the, the company lived just a few minutes away from me once again. Because he, the company moved to London. Yeah, I don't know. It, it just... They they just like me. I think they like me. Nick Masney owns the company now with his wife, Renee. And they're great people, and we've become great friends. And uh, I build kits for them and, uh, you know, try to promote them, as you can see, and stuff like that, because they're great people. And the kits, I, I love them. You know, this uh, nice industrial city stuff. Um, they're... Uh, elevated track the Chicago L they have the New York version they have the Boston version they have all kinds of different versions of of L elevated trackage and uh, probably about 10 or 20 kits I don't know I haven't counted <laughs> I built a whole bunch of them uh, they're uh, uh, Albany Tower uh, skyscraper kit is a wood uh, craftsman kit well, that's uh, 22 inches tall um, and I've probably built about six of them and I know that there's probably about 120 windows in each one I hate doing windows <laughs> actually I, I really hate doing windows <laughs> And after you do about a thousand windows of these, you learn how to do it very easily. And I can build one of these kits very quickly. And so uh, sometimes Imagine That sends me out to do uh, projects out abroad uh, so that we can install their kits. Maybe the customer doesn't know how to build the kits or, or they don't have the artistic skill to paint them or the vision, um, whatever the case may be. Um, I've built many kits for people all over the place. So I invited Nick to come on to the raw, live Raw Sunday show and uh, give us an update or, or uh, uh, what's up, kind of uh, what's happening in his shop kind of thing. And uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, Meet the Modeler interview. And tell us what he's up to these days. Today's video is brought to you by Helicon Focus. Helicon Focus is the photo stacker that makes the most clear photographs that you could ever make. To get 20% off a lifetime license of Helicon Focus, go to modelersguild.com slash HF. And we thank Helicon Focus for their support of our show. And by and Model. And Model has been making model railroad electronics since 2007, and with their affiliation with Pico and their Smart Switch, you can find them in Europe and in North America. Smart Switch switches your switches and animates your models. There's Nick right there. 
So if you press mute up right there, there's a little microphone. If you press that button, it'll start your... There you go. Yep, I'm there, buddy. You're on. All right, how are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? Oh, very good, thanks. Oh, well, look at that in the background. you got a nice presentation going there. Yeah, i got a bunch of stuff I can show if you be. Right on. Right on. So I got this kit recently. I'm going to show that. It's a little dirty looking, but I'm, I called it the Traxler Electric and Transformer Company. A little bit of graffiti on the walls Yay. and stuff like that. And I, want, I wanted to share this while the show, and I, actually I just did the front because I don't know where it's going to go on the layout. I have a feeling it's going to be on an angle, so I'm going to do that when the, when the spot opens up for me. But it's a really nice looking kit. Good to hear, I really right? like. I really liked it. And I love the instructions. You did. You did a good job with the instructions. Uh, the Imagine That Laser Art instructions have been updated. I like it. Yeah, that's our new level, Ron. We're trying to achieve um, a bit of a different, uh, as you know, a different theme and a different look to our product line. And I think we got it where I want it. Yeah, you're doing a really good job, my friend. Thanks. Really good job. So. Uh, how long has this kit been out? It came out last fall? Uh, no, I launched it around uh, Christmas time, actually. Just after Christmas it came out. Oh, okay. I just yeah. seen it last fall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You saw the preview. <laughs> right on, right on. It's a great-looking kit. And uh, as you can see behind Nick there, he's got uh, three versions of it. There's a, a version like I have that's straight across, but then also there's the, the L portion where you could have an office with the warehouse to the side. I like that. You know, yeah, we'll you, some, yeah, we show some pictures of that too later on, or I can hold the models up, whatever, whatever we need to do. Uh, we don't have to do all that stuff in the show today. You can, but I'll, I'll throw it in uh, on the produced version, okay. all nice and full. You know, yeah. so it's not. But uh, you know, I think it's it's it should be pointed out that uh, you know, it's not easy to kit bash a kit. You know, it's not easy for people to wrap their head around uh, the kit that's on the picture on the box can be made different ways. And I think it's it's remarkable that you put out this kit with kit bashing in mind in the plans. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Thanks for recognizing it. A bit of a different angle. Um, you know, there's when you look at how many manufacturers there are out there, um, started to think a bit about how do, how do I differentiate myself a little bit? something a bit different and, and uh, trying to make a kit that's configurable by the modeler into, you know, two or three different versions I thought was a cool advantage. And uh, you see that factory kit 20 as the first opportunity and we're going to keep following that up with uh, the mobile kits in the near future. Same theme where you can kit bash and uh, I can show you a little bit later uh, when the show's live, I guess, if you want, you know, some of the 12 sections and, and the theory behind how they all go together. And how they're configurable. Oh, you're live right now, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, your audio's being uh, scrunched out by your uh, by your video. So, if you could go right up in the middle, right here. Yep. There's a bandwidth. Yep. If you could knock that down one notch, that'll open up your audio a bit more. There you go. That's good. All right. Cool. So it just tightens up your screen a little bit, and that's the only thing that it does. So right. no big deal. So, uh, yeah, you know, differentiating yourself with, with, you know, kind of opening people's minds to kit bashing is a great idea. I think that's, you know, it's so hard for me as a modeler to do, like, my original kits that I was doing was exactly to the picture. I was mimicking what the designer was doing. The fine scale miniatures kits, the same. I wanted to do it very naturally the way uh, George Selios was designing the kit. I wanted to do it exact. I wanted to copy everything exact, you know. So, uh, you coming out with the instructions with the idea of having three different versions of the kit you know, and if your mind's like it, you there's probably 15 versions of the kit that you can yeah. do. Yeah. Is great, you know. It really opens up a skill 
that not many, you know, it's, it's hard to see companies who have instructions that tell you how to paint the model, let alone how to expand on the idea of the design. Yeah, thanks. Well, thanks, Ron. Yeah, I thought it was a cool idea. And, and you know, a lot of those, you just touched on a point that's kind of neat. You know, if you took uh, two of those kits as an example, you could join those things together without any problem. And if you look at, if you kind of look at the way that we have designed the interface of those parts, you know, I've got them all tongue and grooved, if you will, or, or notched. So you could mix and match wall sections as well to make it work the way, whatever way you want it to work, right? So when you looked at that full wall that you've got there, everything could have all fit together and tongue and grooved together nicely to form that long wall section, right? Yeah. Well, it's pretty flexible, I believe. And it's, I think it's easier than trying to take your cellulose kit and you know, trying to make something more out of it than it was designed to be. Not knocking it at all, but just making it easier for the average guy. Just to point out, uh, this is an update, upgrade in the way, the way the kits used to be made. This kit was painted for uh, Mark Williams, the original owner of the company. And uh, as you can see, the old tongue and groove was these these uh these things here these little fingerlets and they didn't they didn't really translate well in the end because you know you need to cover them and and they break off and then also that your walls would go in if you put the parts backwards it would be cockeyed a little bit so yeah. that's really an upgrade in the kits uh, as in my opinion from someone who's built a whole bunch of them <laughs> a lot of them, yeah so yeah and the other thing is is i like how uh in the kit you get these uh when you punch out your window brick inserts you know they can be put in the wall as a, a window that's been smashed out you yep. know exactly. and then, yeah or or in this in this scene here this is where the the warehouse is two floors been you know and this floor has been taken out maybe or maybe this is a manufacturing area or, or something like that so yeah yeah exactly it gives you more options right to, to express your yourself and make that model as you know customize as custom as you want it to be so your version and my version are probably not going to look the same which is which is all right hey actually that just came to mind that's might be how i do that <laughs> Mid-show thoughts here and plans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure. I got to figure out this whole process of sharing my screen properly. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways. So, it, I uh, see in the background there that you've got the Grim Grimsby kit. Yep. I had a gentleman talk to me uh, maybe earlier this month from Texas, and he said that that looks remarkably close to a kit that he, uh, or, or that a building that is close to him. Would you, are you in the position to allow somebody to uh, give you a photo and maybe a cut? maybe some extra parts for a certain prototype that's close to one of your kits? It's possible, yeah. I could, if the drawings that a guy would give me are, are pretty accurate, I could, I could probably whip something up for, a, I guess, a design fee of a sort. But uh, in all honesty, it's a matter of time, right? How much time have you got to, to do the custom work versus uh, keep up with the, with the business and, and make the product uh, you know, out there in the market. So I, I can help. Depends on how serious of a change it is. Yeah, I told the gentleman to get in contact with you, but uh, you know, I figure that some most of the parts that he's talking about are things that you have in your file files already. So you know, it's possible that it's just you know, oh, that's that's easy to do with this. Yeah, it might be. It's, it's worth a look. Yep. Yeah. No so, so that's, that's a good thing to note that, uh, you know, if you've got a, a prototype that's, uh, you know, somewhat outside of what the, the, you know, the product looks like, you know, just ask the manufacturer. These people are human. Like Nick's, Nick's a great guy. He's, he's, <laughs> he's easy to talk to. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> you know, so uh, that's, 
That's an important thing to understand that uh, we're not talking about a company that's uh, manufacturing stuff in China. And, uh, you know, the, the difference between manufacturing time and the sale is like six months of travel on a ship. We're talking about, you know, sometimes these kits are made after the order is done. Yeah. You know, so you, you could have a possibility to... Uh, you know, not not put extra work on Nick's hands, but maybe Nick has something on hand or an idea of to to get your prototype as accurate as you want it to be. So, right? Yeah. So, uh, what do we got on this show that I wanted to share with for Imagine That Laser Art? So, do you got any kits in queue? Oh, yeah. Got a bunch of stuff lined up. Um, one of the things I probably could share with you guys. I've got a, um, a small rooftop kit that I'm about to launch. Um, can I share my desktop, Ron? Just show you yes. a couple pictures. Absolutely. That's what we're all about. Online. Okay, hang on a second. Let me get a file up here. Okay, can you guys see... Uh, let me see. Can you see this? Not yet. Not yet? You press okay. the green button on the side, on this side. Yep. Share screen, and then pick uh, the window where the picture is open in. Got it. There you go. Okay. That's really cool. So there's uh, so this thing uh, we want to put out here shortly, it'll be... Uh, announced officially in our next newsletter probably within about a week or two um, I've got the instructions at, a, at the publishers right now getting done up so um, you guys are seeing it for the first time so we'll talk a little bit about uh, what it is there's basically 19 components that, um, that you get out of this kit um, although you don't if you counted all this up you have a you wouldn't get to 19 but there's a couple of uh, 16 uh, yeah you, there's a few of these in there can you see my cursor? Yeah. 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 So, yeah there's a few uh, extra of those in there, so that adds up to 19. Um, so we got some ducting in here, which is similar to what uh, Ron mentioned in that uh, factory kit. Got the roof walkout. We got four uh, chimneys. I uh, got this awesome water tower that we can talk a little bit more about. Some ventilators um, and these cool air conditioners that uh, that are uh, a really neat little recent design that I came up with that uh, I'm loving and, and I think that it, uh, when it gets out there in the market, I think a bunch of guys ought to appreciate it. So well, that's gonna, a yeah. That, go ahead, Ron. That, that's a big thing on uh, YouTube videos where they'll show a Woodland Scenics plastic kit and uh, then. Uh, they'll talk about you know things that you can do to put these roof units on you know our view uh, ninety percent of the time you're looking at a layout from a helicopter view f uh, down onto the roofs and yep. uh, you know when the roof is undetailed it is it it's noticeable or you yeah. when you see uh, details on the roof the roofs kind of disappear because it's it 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 uh is like the mosaic along the layout now because it's got the detail that it deserves and your mind is expecting. Well, there's also, if I may, when I'm looking at the old Shorty pictures, like from 1905 or 1910, what really catches my eye are those details. It's when there's an overhead, sh and you start to look at the roofs and look at, it's, it's a humanity. This is a hundred years ago, and you're looking at the, the a board laying there. You're looking at the, the the ventilators, the way the chimneys hooked on. You know, I mean, that's what grabs my eye. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yep. And and it's like you're almost stepping back into time of something that you remember that you may have seen when you were traveling, or may have been a building that you were around when you were a kid, or something you experience today on a daily basis. And I think that's a big part of model railroading and also modeling kits and buildings is experiencing I was actually on a roof of a building one time as a kid that's similar to that because my grandfather worked on one and so I saw all those different components that he's showing on the top of the building 
And I can remember taking it back to my grandfather and I sitting there eating a sandwich, having lunch on the rooftop of a building like that. And it just kind of brings you back to those details that you can remember. Yeah, very true. Very good point, Dustin. Yeah, so uh, that's a good idea, bringing these details. Uh, you know, just a small little... Uh, you know, you, everybody's buying paint for all these kits and stuff like that. If you, if you buy a $15 Woodland Scenics kit, you know, this, this little addition isn't going to add too much to the cost. Is this going to be strictly HO? Uh, right now it's, it's strictly HO, but I can scale it up or down uh, depending on uh, where the desire is. Um, I'll give you an example. Here's, my, uh, here's that little rooftop air conditioner I was showing you in the photo. If you guys are going to see this well or not, and that's HO scale, and then here's the uh, here's the I think S scale version approximately of that. So basically, oh, wow. you, you can scale it up and down and do different things, put those fans in different places. Um, so it's helping or hurting. I don't know if I'm making anybody nauseous by moving this stuff. No, around. you're good. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah, how so this, small? Yeah. How small in scale can you go, Nick? Uh, I, I do sell N scale, and it uh, gets a little bit tricky down in N scale because of the material thicknesses and, and things such as that. Um, hang on, I'll grab a I'll grab an example for you. The problem with N scale really is, uh, you know, that uh, you, where in HO scale you 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 put on an, an extra pad with the fan on. In N scale, it's better to just etch the fan into the part you know because right i i've destroyed details just getting them out of the sprue <laughs> with my fingers or my tweezers you know and, i can relate to that yeah well when you're working with wood as opposed to plastic end scale is 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 a real challenge oh, yes yeah so here's an end scale staircase oh uh, wow for our elevated line cool and uh it's not an easy. Oh, that's nice. Sorry, my hand, shaking, my hand's shaking like crazy, but but that's got all um, all individual staircase treads in it as well. Um, so it's a bit of a wow. challenge to build, but in all honesty, it's uh, it's a beautiful little model. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of what what's possible in N. Um, just to give you a bit of a another view. Here's a, here's one of our buildings. An end scale. Oh wow! Yeah. And when you oh, start, wow. yeah, that looks like the Concord Hotel down here in Oklahoma City. Actually, <laughs> it's a short that, one. that's that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Oh, good, glad to hear it. So wow, this same look at entry. This same model exists in HO scale in our product line, and even uh, I can even do it in in S and O scale. But uh, when you get down to end scale, you can kind of see where the details get really, really fine, and you've got a bit of a limitation with the laser on on what you can cut and how thin you can cut it. So right, that's right. just a small example of what's possible. But that's uh, that's our bait, one of our products that's available out there today in end scale. Uh, could I ask you what laser you, you're using? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, absolutely, I'm using an Epilog. Um, Epilogue Mini. It's a 12-inch by 18-inch laser. If I if I move over here like this, you'll see it down there in the lower left corner. Okay. The reason I'm asking, I was actually looking at Epilogue uh, one of their videos, and they were demonstrating their high-end uh, CO2 the size of a Volkswagen. I was like, holy <laughs> Moses! <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's massive. This is a CO2 laser, also. It's a 45 watt laser, so it's it's kind of uh, it's powerful enough to cut all this wood. Obviously, you can cut plastics with it. Um, you can't really cut steel or metal, but you can etch all that stuff. Um, so you know, it's it's a great little tool. It's not a it's not a cheap tool, I'll be honest with you. But yeah. uh, it uh, it does some great stuff, and and an Epilogue's been really good in terms of support as well. So. You know, I would, you know, I'd recommend those guys. For yeah, sure. I mean, I, that was like I said, I was, I was on their website and they had a little video showing. Guy was using two different. I mean, I, that's impressive, you know. But yeah. I, I did a little research. The one they were showing, it was like twenty-two grand for the. I was like, okay, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's their basically their entry level price, I think, for some of their lasers. You can buy some of the stuff I'm hearing. I haven't tried it, but you can buy Chinese uh, knockoffs, you know, for a couple of grand. But in all honesty, I don't know if I would trust the um, the fact that you could get service and you could get support and things like that. So that's a risk. That's the detail right there I was going to want to bring across is like when you buy something from China, the instructions are not even close to what, you know, you would like them to be. And just imagine what the support call would sound like, you know, uh, <laughs> Epilogue's a, a North American company. I don't know where they're located, but, uh, you, know, right. that, you know, you can contact these people and you know where their head quarters are even if they do have a headquarters you know like in china you never know what you're gonna get <laughs> yeah very true i have a question from the chat for nick from manilo csx um says this is a question for nick and uh, uh let's see is a modern era warehouse available of uh, you know, the warehouses like you see in an industrial park. Oh, okay. Uh, hang on one sec. I don't know if this is going to be very modern. Depends on uh, what his definition of, of modern might be, but this is an actually, example. I, of actually, I believe, I believe it's a she. I believe. <laughs> okay. So that's that's an example of a kind of a warehouse panel section um, uh, industrial building that we have that we do. I don't have any of the newer, you know, like you know the current, I guess late '80s kind of stuff. Uh, no, I don't have that. We seem to be more into the uh, brick mortar kind of transition era and earlier stuff that you see in the pretty downtowns of uh, of North America. Well, these are these are modern in the sense that they're still here, but yeah. 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 Drive through Detroit; it's it's pretty much the only buildings that are still standing, kind of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, and you can modernize them in the in the sense of bricking up windows or treating them with uh, you know brand new brand new air conditioners on the roof and uh, signage and stuff like that too. Yeah, if I pull into my kit. My doodads from my ITLA kit is I can pull out the inserts for the brick. You probably yeah. can't see that very well, but uh, that's a you know those are things that you pull out of the kit, and I always save them. I always save these things. I've got little bags like this all over the place. <laughs> yeah, those are it's such a good idea to brick up one or two windows. You know, that's like making a a brick that's a uh, you know, one of those off bricks that's kind of a different color, you know, yep. adds yep. texture to your building. Well, you know, I can go downtown Camden, South Carolina, down the main part of the street, and it's all, the front part of the buildings are basically modern, and all the, as a whole second and third story one is all bricked up, because they, you see the bank, you know, like the National Bank, or like as it was, now it's like a, a boutique. But all the upper upper windows, you know, you'd be, at one time must were uh, uh, it just bricked up, but it's it's it's, mo it's, it's 2015, and the building's got like 1903 on the um, you know on the structure. It's just wild. Yep, very hey, true. Very I true. hear you, Dustin. Talk to you later. Thanks for coming on. Guys, have a great day. Thanks again. Talk to you later. No, but I, I just my point I was just trying to say was that that and people get so stuck on an era, and really it just it's the details that change the era. Mm -hmm. We were uh, uh, Ron and I were talking about this old corner bookstore. It's been around since 1712 in in Boston. 1712. I said and, 1850. And you know, you know what's right now? It's a Chipotle's. <laughs> It's such a good structure too. Uh, I hope somebody doesn't do it before we get to do it. But oh my goodness, it's such I, a I'm nice started, structure. I'm started. I'm started on it, but I gotta. Um, I, I gotta work on the. Um, uh, we're talking about the engraving, cut details, and all that kind of crap. And 
Hey, you know what? That that might be a topic topic that we talk to Nick about sometime. You know, uh, uh, designing stuff for laser cutters, like uh, laser cutting companies. You know, I met like Nick said that the cost of an epilogue printer is, is pretty drastic. You know, the compared... lower the the cheapest I saw was like eight grand, and that's not even counting the fume extractor and the whiz yes. bang stuff. You know. Yeah. yeah. So. Go the other thing, sorry, buddy. The other thing to remember is if if you were going to dabble in this stuff, at every couple of years you got to recharge the laser tube, which is about two thousand bucks. <laughs> Holy smokes! <Yeah. laughs> so you if know, you bought that's, it, that's that's true. Almost anything they they'll say, hey, buy this, and you can do such and such, and then you find out, well, okay, but you also got to get this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, all right. Hey, guys. Look, you can buy a a inkjet printer for only forty dollars at Walmart, <laughs> right? And it's like, how much is the uh, the cartridges? Yeah, <laughs> more than the printer cost. <laughs> and if you go and open up one of those printer ca cartridges that you bought with the printer, it, it's it's a piece of foam inside there, and and you can like the ink's supposed to fill up the foam. It's just about this much of the foam is the color that you're looking for. If it's a black uh, thing, it's it's pure white, three quarters of the foam. Ninety percent of the foam is pure white, and you only get an itty bitty bit of black in the bottom. It's a scam. But anyways, getting back to the topic is maybe uh, it's a good topic for the show for uh, Ed for us to talk to Nick about. Uh, what he would require if he wanted, if if we had a custom kit to build, yep. and what would make it easiest for him to be able to cut something custom for somebody, you know, like what are right, the design right. files? What are the things that he needs? Uh, not to take his business away from him, but to uh, do all the hard parts ourselves, because you know, it's, nothing gets as nothing's done good enough for you unless you do it yourself. Right, so if we were able to put together this bookstore and send it to Nick, what are the details that Nick requires to do that? You know, and that would probably by, translate. By how, well, the, the, I was looking online, and the, one of the uh, uh, services that were doing laser cutting, and they were talking about the um, the different colors that shows. Uh, it was at least their software. It was shades of gray, depending on how deep the the engraving was. And what colors were cuts, and what color were engravings or, or, or gray shades? That the 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 kerf, I guess the word for the laser beam, and, uh, you know, and all that sort of stuff like that. Because uh, uh, we can do some G whiz stuff. It doesn't do a damn bit of good if he, Nick has to go. Well, sorry, dude, but I can't. You know, I can't cut this because you're a dumb butt. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Yeah, well. <laughs> he would text it. <laughs> yeah, I might text it. <laughs> I might etch it into no, my neck. Yeah, no, I, I, I do. The reason I'm, I'm just saying it, I do, I do uh, uh, 3D mesh stuff for people. Uh, okay. And I, I'm like, I get frustrated. Like, can't you read? <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. you could, uh, yeah, I could work with you guys in the future. It's no problem. Uh, a line drawing, like you're suggesting, the different grays and black tones really, really um, tell the laser how deep to etch. The simplest right, way right. to put it. Right. So black is deep, and then a, like a 50% black would be obviously 50% less deep of an etch. And then you've got different thicknesses of lines for cutting and stuff like that. So, so I could. I could help you with all that. Yeah, what what's your preferred? Uh, what was DX DXF? Is that is that the? Uh, well, you could do. What do you design in? What software are you using? Uh, I use I use SketchUp for my for because I'm doing 3D stuff. Okay, I've I've never converted a SketchUp file. I've taken AutoCAD files and brought them in, which I think are. I can't no, remember. There's, there's a plugin. I've actually I actually used it. Had a uh, a plugin that would convert it. I didn't play with it. I, I, I cut. I did one DXF file and I sent it to somebody, and he actually worked on his thing. So uh, it, it's doable, but I know that like Corel Draw or um, yeah. or, or something like that's preferred, and that's fine. I was just 
curious. Yeah. yeah. So what I would do, Edward, is take I would try to take your file and bring it into Corel Draw. That's what I drive the laser with, basically, is a okay. Corel Draw 2D, 2D drawing package. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, I was looking at Corel Draw actually for stuff because it's, it's, there's no reason to uh, to have to go. You might as well go to the, the correct yeah. software. Yeah, yeah, reducing it, the amount it, of work. It, right? it's, it's silly to, uh, and I, I stay with SketchUp because it's I can do whatever I want, uh, and I don't feel like paying seven thousand dollars for a solid works. So. Yeah. Perfect. You know, uh, yeah. that's ridiculous if you can get it done. And the other part is, I tell people, it's what you're used to, and you you got the kinks out, you know how it works, you know yep. that, that sort of thing. But, exactly. Yeah, I, I was looking at Corel Draw. Now everything that everything they do, Corel does, is all on the, uh, it's in the cloud. You buy yep. a subscription. So. Yeah, it may it may be an importable file extension. We could we could look at that and give uh, give a test file a try. Yeah. As an example, but here's here's a thought for you guys. If you're if you're talking about or thinking about going down that path, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reference um, my little wall panels here for a second, because the real challenge that that I learned after buying this company was taking a lot of the existing designs, and, and Ron will remember a lot of them. He talked about the real finger jointed um, um, uh, connections and, and whatnot, but you really got to think in your kit. If you're going to build a one of, you can probably get away with things that don't fit, and you can make wall sections fit. So, uh, you could do it one time. But if you're going to make something that is intended to be repeatable, and that you're going to sell to somebody, or that you're going to offer a limited run to, you got to think of the engineering behind the kit build itself, right? So. How do the parts go together? Can they go together reliably and repeatedly? You know, could they be? You know, when I when I design that wall section, can I can I take the right thickness prescribed piece of brickwork and cover that joint effectively like a pilaster? You know, so all of that kind of engineering thought has to go into your kit, um, and that's really what you know. I honestly enjoy that to a degree. I know it sounds maybe sounds weird, but that's kind of a challenge in making these things is to is to make them repeatable. Come up with a method that uh, makes it easy for the modeler to put together, and you know you can build it with efficiency. Uh, I, I, as a manufacturer, can make it with efficiency. Um, those are the challenges that it, that you got to think about as well. That's a good point. Uh, I just recently built this kit. From a company, uh, uh, 3D Puzzles, I think. And in the instructions, he referenced the fact that the corners are mitered, right? But when I got the kit, the corners are not mitered, which just tells me that, you know, when he first designed the kit and wrote the instructions, he had a great idea about what he could do to manufacture this kit with carpentry techniques. And it's just real hard to put a miter on one of these pieces of wood. You know, so uh, that's a good point, you know, to, to think about the engineering of the kit, you know. And because of this kit has a stone out exterior, it's really hard to, to, to put a pillar outside on the outside. So you really got to think about how you're doing it. And I just put pieces of stick on the inside. Yep. You know, but, yep. yeah. But that's it's a good point. That's, that's, a, that's the same thing if you're, um, when I'm, just still here just for just a second this is a uh, uh, some light fixtures I was doing and the engineer and trying to figure how to make the parts fit together but also you're within the constraints of the printing process and it's people will come up and say well can't you do such and such wouldn't that be neat I say yeah that'd be neat but you can't do that or it's not you gotta hook it to a sprue. It's gotta, um, you know, the the, and that's all. It, like you were saying, that's the fun part. I'm just trying, trying to figure it to make make it so that, um, this this part here, I got a sprue hooked to the inside so it don't show in the light globe, right? Yep. And here's the little cap. Well, I gotta make a cutout to fit over where the little sprue breaks off so it 
you know, and that that's the sort of fun you're like, well, that's what are you doing? Oh, I'm having fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if if you want to get even even weirder, Edward, then you start to think about because as a modeler, all of us are, you start to think about, well, how do I clean up that little tiny uh, joint that I had left with the sprue? Do I want it on a show surface or near a show surface? I don't want to bury it somewhere where I know it's going to get hidden, right? Yeah. So that's the other level of thinking that you can apply to. Yeah, when you first bought the company, we had a discussion about wood grain. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. And mm -hmm. when you got the, uh, these uh, parts in a sprue, when you when the wood grain is opposite to the, to the little tab, when you twist it, it pulls a piece off of the window. Right, yeah. but if you do it with with the grain, or maybe I'm saying it opposite. I don't know. When you twist that window, it just pops right off because it, it breaks with the grain, you know. Yeah. So that's one of the things you don't recognize until you've broken off 150 windows for a skyscraper four <laughs> times in a row. But you know that that sort of thing is like the paper modelers. People don't realize there's a grain in paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. It will it will bend easier in one direction or, or roll in one direction because it's when they're, the paper is manufactured it's laid down it actually has a grain to it yeah um, and that's the sort of thing that you can use to your advantage if you're uh, if you're if you're no you can't yeah that's a good point well, well you know what though but you're on the right path though Edward because I, I use grain to my advantage I have to because a lot of the parts that get that have to get shaped, you need to take that green as your advantage for flexibility. So hang on, I'll show you something else. That uh, the water tower being a good example. Yep. That might be what he's tower, showing. <laughs> you got it. The water tower is a good example. Maybe I'll um, hang on one second here. This is some good content here, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> This is all free flow. Yeah. So, um, so here's here's an example of there's the water tank skin that comes in those kits, okay? And when you're done making your water tank, it's gonna look it's gonna look like this, where she's been wrapped around a core. But you can't wrap it without pre-soaking this in, in water and forming it around a, a core of the same size as that water tank. So the, when I cut this, if you look, well, you'll probably not see the grain. See the grain goes up and down in this picture. Yeah. Okay. I'm showing you, it's because I want that part to curve this way, right? Yeah. I want to help it. I want to help it. If I if I cut that part the other direction, I would have a really hard time wrapping that guy. Even with hey, water, well, even with water, you wouldn't have a hope in hell hey, to. You're bend you're it. you're going and, and the thing. What's really funny is you're going back to the uh, the old furniture makers when they were yeah. steaming wood in order to. Yeah. Th they had to look at which direction the grain is. I mean, that's just mechanically it makes sense. You got it. So there's uh there's a tower structure for the Grimsby Station. You mm. can kind of that's all formed. Whoops, I'm too close. Maybe that's all formed around a core. Mm -hmm. Example, so that wood has been pre-soaked as well and formed, and it's easy to do. It just you, know, you soak it for about an hour in some hot water. You wrap it around um, something like a, a glue bottle or something that's about that size and shape. Um, throw some elastic bands on it, walk away, come back in a couple hours, and it's ready to go. Glue it on your substructure. Yeah, being so in. Yep. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that was reminding me of uh, I was watching the video they were building a water tank. What was the what was um, the guy that was doing uh, the filthy jobs? What it was, you know the uh, jobs, dirty jobs. He was oh, doing. They were they were rebuilding some water tanks, and they were showing they were and there's a part of the process. They were like steaming um, curves in some of the parts and stuff like that. It was just like, you know, just wow. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the man's name's Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe, there you go. Good show. That was actually a show by the one where they were they were rebuilding the water wooden water tank on top of the buildings. Yeah. Yeah. For modelers, I was like, look at this, man. There's instructions on how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you're right. There, those things are on every building in in any big city, right, or any city for that matter, because 
that was the fire prevention, that was your water supply. They're all over the, the rooftops in Chicago, New York, and many, probably this, in the cities you live in, I'm sure, too. Right? So it's a great detail that doesn't seem to get modeled very much. No, and it's, it's, it's not old history. It's modern history. It's, the, uh, uh, it's easier to pump if water pressure. It's, you, you only pump. You can only. Water pressure will only shove water so high against you know gravity or air pressure. So they got to put them on top. Of it. I mean that's like you yeah. said that's for fire or uh, other uh, things that's that has to be there because otherwise you're going you're you're up the creek and which is 2015 and there's guys out redoing the stuff today. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, Ed. Because if the power goes out today, you want something that works. You know. Oh, well, you know Still. what? It's like if it if it if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. It's been exactly. around forever, and here's 2015. They're like, "Well, isn't that old process?" Yes, and we're using <laughs> it because it works. Yeah, that's true. And and being in from Canada, me and Nick live about uh, an hour away from each other. Uh, you know, wetting this wood down is a technique that we have to use during the winter in most cases, and I imagine that it's still necessary down south because and, and the reason we've got to wet the wood up here is because we've got uh, this gas fired heat stove in the background here and it's drying everything tinder dry and if you don't wet it it's still going to split even if you've got it bending in the proper way towards the grain so yeah it's important to uh, wet soak it use the elastics and let it dry and then you glue it and then put the elastics on again when you know maybe cut the excess off that that the where it overlaps on the side where it's you know it's just important to to do that part of soaking the wood to get these things to do what you want it well, to do I, I, and again, that's it go ahead you know, i'm just saying that you know you're just repeating what has been done for uh like uh wood wood guys using veneer on wood in the 1700s yeah. 1800s i mean that's yeah, how the master craftsman did it Hey, I, I built circular stairs uh, for about four years, and uh, we still use veneer. We still soak it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, where was I? I will be joking there about Ron and circular stairs, but I can't think of it. <laughs> hey, Ron, I got an idea. Go for it. How about painting? Painting this stuff. Aye. Aye. So, what I did to paint... This stuff is I avoided. Uh, I got to crazy glue that part back on. I avoided mortar lines altogether because this building's really old, and I've heard people say. Uh, I heard Scotty Mason say once uh, that there's not one single building he's ever seen that didn't have mortar lines, but I'd like to add to that statement. He's right. However, if the mortar lines have been. Uh, there since the 1920s they've been through steam uh where they've they've got the soot of uh steam engines especially if it's beside the rails you know you're never ever going to see a mortar line on those buildings and if you do see a mortar line it's going to be a charcoal black so uh, I avoided putting the mortar lines in this, this structure. I just painted it with red oxide paint. Came back and painted my uh, foundation with aged concrete. Painted a nice black line across the top here so I could put my sign on. And I used my Cricut. I used my Cricut die cutter to cut out the, 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 the custom sign. But... Uh, uh, Nick puts the kit out with uh, printed signs, which are, are just as nice. And uh, I, I know I, I veered off the path, but I usually do that, you know, to, to give people uh, the chance to recognize that they can expand on a kit after they buy it. It is their kit, right? Uh, just to reinforce your point, this is a photo I took down in Camden the other day. I'm, oh, awesome. I'm, I'm, yeah, ain't it great? I, was, I love walking down the alleys and behind the buildings because it's, it's like it was a hundred years ago, right? Well, not as good shape, 
but the point is, I mean, I am close. And look how the 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 mortar is almost the same color as the brick from. Yep. Ten feet away. Looks a little yellow. Yeah, I mean, up the the down low it is, but I'm only about three foot from that. But just yeah. look look up 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 a little bit, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty feet up. Yeah, this yeah, was a uh, uh, this is an old building. Uh, I mean. Now the modeling challenge I see with that is the multicolored bricks. Now, well, you notice the newer brick is a yellow, but look up above, up there, it's all dark. It, it is, it's you can't really see the mortar. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And and the mortar has been uh, uh, worn away with acid rain and all that jazz, uh, further obscuring the view of it. Right, I love it though. It's an awesome photo, Edward. Yeah, and that I could. That's as that's as best I could get because the the alley's so narrow. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> leaning back, like I want to get on a, a like a selfie stick so I can actually get up there and and <laughs> what that poor thing. What that means up here? They got ventilation using the brick itself. Yeah. Oh my God, Ed. You know what? There's one thing seeing you walk around town with the camera taking pe pictures of people's buildings, but with a selfie stick, man, I'd like to see a third person view of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had I had a cop eyeball on the other day when I was taking pictures. Yeah. Some guy walking down alleys. Yeah, you got to wonder yeah, what he's yeah, up to. Yeah. Like, no, I'm not really. I'm just a model railroader. <laughs> you know what? Being a model railroader is better in their eyes than a rail fan. I saw somebody waving a, a tripod in the background. It's got Check an idea. This out. Check this out. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? That's a that's a that's a uh, uh, a jack holding a, with a beam on this part of the wall. Look. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's permanent fixture. Yeah. Actually, it looks like it's 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 embedded in the the cinder blocks below. Yeah, it goes right down to the to the lintel. Wow. Um, <laughs> the the window is actually filled in with uh, blocks. Yeah. So the, it's a floor jack. Yeah. And it's... he's holding up a uh, like a four by four, which is holding up the uh, this part of the wall. Wow. I love that stuff. You know, that's like the details. Like, uh, you know, like what is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey, Ron, let me let me show you um, a wall section here with some coloration that you might find interesting. There's, we talked about different color. I don't know if it's going to show well or not. It's good. We talked, we talked about different colors and different tones and stuff in the brick. You can see here where. We're starting to achieve that by putting, you know, by adding layers of trans, like really, really thinned out paint. Mm -hmm. These are all uh, water-based acrylics. Very simple stuff, like um, actually, like this right here. Uh, it's ba it's reading backwards, but that's just an Americana. No, it's uh, it's, it's straight for us. It's just yeah. backwards for you. <laughs> that's the beauty of broadcast. But uh, actually, I had a conversation with Pierre Oliver. Uh, I love it. Another, lo it. another local modeler, modeler and he said uh, he'd like to see uh, yellow brick buildings. And uh, this, the the process that you use to create these kits with the the wood that you're using really does represent uh, yellow, yellow brick really nicely, really yeah, nicely. I'm not look, gonna look at the photo I got right there on, on the screen. That's uh. uh how many colors do you see? I mean, this is. Oh yeah. You got yellow. You got somebody had this thing in blue at one time. Yep. But there's red brick. There's and if you see here, this is the original brick. It's black, like Ron was saying. They yep. filled that window in because the 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 uh, it's got a light colored mortar. And originally that was a nice building. They had beautiful, a light kind of a yellowish brick around it. Yep. Yeah. Coin was yellow. That's awesome. Yep, and they sometimes built with different color bricks too, right? For accent. Mm-hmm. 
Right. So I'm, I'm going to sneak a little something in a photo here, but I'm not going to show it all because this is a new product that isn't, <laughs> close, isn't there yet. But you can see the yellow brick. Oh, my God. That okay. looks beautiful. I love it. I love it. So you guys are getting another preview. Um, let me see if I can turn the side so you can kind of see some of those parts that are – these are those those rooftop kit parts I was talking about. Don't tell anybody, but I think it's a hotel. Hey, hey, you know it's a leto. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, that's, but there's your yellow brick version, and you know why? Is because, as Ron said, here's the raw material, right? It's already in a yellow brick. Right. And what you're really doing is slightly accenting it with some really watered-down tones of yellow and brown and even some orange tones that, uh, that end up on top of that, too. So and lots of cool opportunities. The significance of uh, the color of brick really is the type of soil that surrounds you. You know, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, where a lot of our bricks were, were made, uh, other than the stuff that was imported, uh, is red brick. Uh, the stuff that uh, we find around the London area in all the rural houses and stuff, it's really rare to find red brick. It, you find yellow brick. I don't know if that was because it was a cheaper type of brick or that's the stuff that came in from the States or what have you. But, you know, sometimes uh, the color of brick is a localized thing. So, uh, you know, everybody making brick buildings out of red oxide paint, you know, sometimes locally that's not what you're witnessing. So it's a real opportunity to get uh, these uh, yellow... Uh, these these wood kits that are created with the brick so that you can do uh, this yellow brick. You know, some people are using uh, basswood and stuff like that where it's really a white, white wood. And sure, the, the, the laser burning process will add a little bit of color to it, but the, the products that uh, Imagine That Laser Art are using for their bricks are already... Uh, kind of yellowish so once you get the the laser cutting that you can see along the line here you know that's really starts adding some color and taste to your model so that's a that's something that's unique to you uh, imagine that laser art that I don't think a lot of people understand and that's that's actually something that I'm gonna have to make a video of is to do some yellow brick there's a there's a picture of a Camden, South Carolina, and they used both the red brick and the uh, yellow. Yeah, that's pretty neat. That's and neat. It, what gets me is you look off the fancy front, you look down the side, it's all falling apart. It's rotting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that they used the the prime bricks for the front oh, that's face right. yeah. of the building, and then the uh, stuff was on the front, and they didn't care about the side. And on right. the like side, that. you'll see multicolored bricks uh, and uh, orangey well, color bricks as opposed to red. I imagine the grade, the the stuff on the front were a higher grade and more costly, and then the secondary brick or the was for the the side. It didn't show. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Damn, you're good. You knew that already. I'm sure. Yeah, you're just I did. Playing, uh, you've been playing me up all show today. I don't know what the heck's going on with you guys. What did because, I do? Because you're <laughs> a wonderful guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I smile and put a little star. Jeez. <laughs> there you go. You gotta do that in your video. Make it like a like a. Uh, who was it? The actor used to. He'd smile and like a little. Ping. Yeah. And yeah. It would. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that just derailed that. Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah, exactly. So I want to thank Nick for coming on the show and uh, hope him the best of luck in all his ventures. Thanks for watching.